from Sheffield. Uh, welcome to the summer school. Um, so I, I can't remember when the summer school started. I think it was started by Neil Lawrence in about 2013. Okay. Uh, I think I've been involved since about 2014, but there were events before then. Okay. And we've seen kind of the popularity rise and grow and grow every, every year, really. And so we sell out quite quickly now. And it kind of reflects the, uh, the, the growth and the interest in Gaussian processes. So I started working on GPs after my PhD in 2008. Okay. And then, you know, I'd never heard of GPs. I, was, I did my PhD in statistics, but I didn't know what a Gaussian process was. Okay. And I, I, I tend to work with applied scientists. And back then, you know, uh, 10 years ago, if I went and talked to a scientist about Gaussian, uh, Gaussian processes, I could guarantee none of them have ever heard of Gaussian processes. Okay. Whereas nowadays, I think nearly everyone in statistics, everyone in machine learning knows what a Gaussian process is or have heard something about them. And if you go and talk to scientists in a whole range of disciplines, you know, climate scientists or chemists or physicists, it's not uncommon for them to know what Gaussian processes are already. The, kind of the popularity has really exploded. I think I, I was reading a paper by um, um, what is it, Michael Bettencourt and um, Andrew Gelman the other day, and he was talking about Gaussian processes once being kind of like the, the best china of statistics. They're kind of, you know, the, 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 the things you kept in the cupboard for special occasions. You know, when, you're, when your granny came around for Sunday lunch, you kind of brought out your Gaussian processes. Uh, whereas now they kind of become ubiquitous and they're being used all over the place. That's not necessarily a good thing, is what they were saying in that paper, but it's kind of the, the state we find ourselves in, that they're, and they're being used uh, frequently in, you know, not just in machine learning statistics, but in kind of many applied areas of science. So, we've got a busy uh, few days. Okay. So, um, today I'm going to give like, the first introduction to Gaussian processes. Then Nicola is going to give a, a second introduction after lunch, and there'll be a, a fair amount of repetition, I imagine, there, and that's a good thing. You know, it helps to hear things in two different points of view. Okay. And then uh, this afternoon, we've got, um, well, the, st the structure we have for the, entire, uh, the first three days is we have two tutorial talks in the morning, an hour and a half each. Okay. Then we have lunch, and then we have a lab session in the afternoon okay, for a couple of hours where we'll get you to try and do things. Uh, in Python, and we'll, we'll be wondering around helping you. And then, the last thing in the afternoon before we break up for the day, uh, we have a, a kind of a slightly more technical, uh, kind of more cutting edge talk on a slightly more advanced topic. So, this afternoon, we've got Zen Wen from Amazon coming, talking about computationally efficient GPs. And we'll repeat the same thing on Tuesday, same thing on Wednesday, but and we'll kind of build up the complexity each day. Then, on Thursday, uh, we've got uh, a research workshop essentially. So, and um, the talks are kind of um, current research, they're, they're no longer pedagogical, they're talking about act, uh, things people are actively working on in the field. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is just kind of give you um, a gentlish introduction to Gaussian processes. Uh, I'm very happy to be interrupted and to make this a discussion as much as necessary, okay, so any questions, anything unclear, just stop and we'll have a conversation about it, yeah. The, uh, there's another introduction coming afterwards, so um, there's lots of time, yeah. so please do interrupt. Okay. So before we do um, Gaussian processes, it makes sense just to spend a little bit of time talking about Gaussian distributions. So I imagine everyone here knows what a Gaussian distribution is, right? It's this kind of bell-shaped curve, okay, who represents the density. So kind of notation I'm going to use, and I imagine it'll be fairly standard, is to write things like this down. Okay? So if x is our random variable, okay, a quantity that is random that we don't know its value of, okay, we're going to write x twiddles into like normal mu sigma squared to indicate this is a normal random variable or a Gaussian random variable okay, with some mean mu okay, and some variance sigma squared. So the, the mean tells us the location of this distribution where in space it is situated. Okay. So here I've got a mean zero uh, Gaussian distribution. So it, this bell-shaped curve is centered around zero. Okay. The variance tells us the spread. So you've got the mean and the spread. Okay. It tells us how wide or how narrow this distribution is. So here it's normal 0, 1. So uh, we've got about 95% of the distribution between two standard deviations and 66% between one standard deviation, either side of the mean. Okay. Oh, we're going to talk about things like probability density functions and uh, cumulative distribution functions. Okay, so the, the PDF of the Gaussian, I'm sure you've all seen it, it's this e to the minus some quadratic in x. Yep. So x is a thing we don't know. This tells us its density as x varies. And the, the key kind of shape is an exponential 
to some quadratic in X. That's a key kind of characteristic of a Gaussian uh, probability density function. The cumulative distribution function is the probability that random variable is less than some value. Okay. So this is uh, everyone's familiar with all of this, right? Okay. So uh, one question is why why are Gaussians studied all the time? Why uh, are statisticians and you know uh, any kind of probabilistic model are obsessed with using Gaussian distributions? And the kind of answer is because they're very natural and they're mathematically convenient. Yeah? They're natural in the sense they appear all the time, uh, kind of naturally out of uh, processes we might consider, and they're also easy to work with. And that's particularly important for Gaussian processes. And we'll come back to that idea several times. So one nice property of Gaussian distributions, we're just talking about distributions still here, okay, is that they're closed under linear operations. You can do lots of things to Gaussians and to Gaussian processes, and they remain Gaussian distributions or Gaussian processes. You can add them together. Yeah. You can subtract them. You can multiply them by things. Okay. When we get onto Gaussian processes, you can differentiate them. You can integrate them. Okay. You can apply any linear operator to them, and they remain Gaussian processes. Okay. That's a nice property uh, for a model to have, because when you do things to your model, it still remains in a tractable form. So you've all heard of the central limit theorem. This is one kind of example of why they occur naturally. Yep. So if you take a sum of independent identically distributed random variables, you add them up, okay, you, l you look what happens to that sum, and you get more and more of them. The central limit theorem says eventually the mean of them uh, starts to look like a Gaussian random variable. Okay. So because of this, they're kind of a natural kind of distribution to use because they appear naturally when you get processes that are the sum of lots of little things, lots of inter interactions. Things start to look Gaussian pretty quickly. Okay. So there's other kind of nice properties. So there's something called maximum entropy. Uh, maximum entropy. So entropy is kind of the opposite of information, how disordered um, things are, uh, random variables are. And there's something called the maximum entropy principle, which is a, a kind of guiding principle in some areas of machine learning and statistics. And it says that whenever you're unsure about things, you should use the distribution with the maximum entropy, with the largest entropy. Okay. And one nice property about the Gaussian is that if you consider all distributions that have mean mu and variance sigma squared, the Gaussian distribution is the distribution that has the highest possible entropy. Okay. So under various kind of paradigms and statistics, you know, this idea that if you don't know anything, you should use the thing with the largest entropy, we're saying, well, maybe a Gaussian is the right thing to kind of do. There's other things for kind of mathematicians here. They, they're infinitely divisible. Okay, so any Gaussian can, can be considered to be the sum of n independent Gaussians. Okay, and the converse is also true. If a random variable is the sum of two random variables, okay, and that random variable is Gaussian, then the, the things it's the sum of must also be Gaussian. So there's all these kind of properties that are unique to Gaussians. Yeah. It makes them very kind of they occur all the time in mathematics. These kind of one thing we're going to need to use at points, okay, uh, and this is a, another property that's true only for Gaussians. Suppose you've got two random variables, x and y, and that they're uncorrelated, okay, then they're independent if and only if they are Gaussian. Yep, so uncorrelated implies independence only for Gaussians. Okay. And final one then, before we kind of go back to pictures. Uh, Gaussians kind of, uh, Gaussian terms appear naturally in many procedures. Okay. When we give uh, non-probabilistic procedures, when we try and interpret them, we can often give them a probabilistic interpretation um, by thinking in terms of Gaussian distributions. Okay. So for example, suppose we're trying to fit some model as a function of x with some parameter beta to data, okay. and we're going to try and fit it to the data by just minimizing the sum of squared errors. Yep. So there's no, no probability here, no statistics. We've just got some objective function, sum of squared errors, we like squared errors because it's differentiable. Okay. And we're going to try and fit uh, the parameter by minimizing the sum of squared errors. Okay. You might ask, well, what are we doing here? Okay. What, ha what does this mean when we do this? Well, one interpretation of any process that had squared errors is that you're doing maximum likelihood on estimation where you're assuming everything is Gaussian, all your error terms are Gaussian. Okay. So they kind of occur naturally here. A squared error loss is equivalent somewhere to um, kind of a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's just something about univariate Gaussians. 
Let's go back to pictures and think about multivariate Gaussian distributions. So I should have asked actually before I started. Who, who here um, has a maths background? And, and who is uh, more kind of a computer science? And who, who is neither of those things? Okay. Those of you who are neither of those things, what kind of background, where, where, what kind of areas are you from? Engineering. Physics. Physics. So, so all the people here are on engineers, physicists, computer scientists, and mathematicians. Well, what's your area? Okay. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> classical biologist. Uh, what I mean is, you've got a lot of maths, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. A everyone has quite mathematically that. That's good. So, nothing I've said so far, hopefully, is a surprise. So let's think about multivariate Gaussian distributions then. Okay? So multivariate just means two or more random variables. Okay? And we'll build up in pictures till we get to um, Gaussian processes. Okay? So just to write them down mathematically first, um, we're going to write x is a multivariate normal distribution, or Gaussian distribution, with some mean vector, mu, and some covariance matrix, sigma. Okay? So now, so some pictures in a minute. The mean is no longer a point in the space, it's a vector in whatever space we're in. So if we've got a d-dimensional uh, multivariate Gaussian, this is a vector that points to a space in um, our d, and it tells us where this point is located. Okay? So if it's a multivariate Gaussian in three dimensions, the vector points to the point in three dimensions where we are. Okay. Then we've got the, co the variance covariance matrix, sigma, which is a d by d matrix. Okay? And that just tells us the variance between any two points. So let's think about a bivariate case. So D is 2, so we've just got two random variables. X, which is just X1, X2, so it's a point in the plane. Yep. The mean just points to a point in that plane, and then the variance covariance matrix, you can always think about it in this term, in this way. Okay. So the, the terms on the diagonal, these are the variance of the individual elements. Okay. So the, the term in the first uh, top corner is the variance of X1, one on the bottom is the variance of X2. And the things on the off diagonals are the covariance between the pairs of the random variables. Okay. So the top right is going to be uh, the covariance between x1 and x2. And the way this breaks down is in terms of the correlation between x1 and x2 uh, times by the two standard deviations. Yeah. So standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Yeah. So to work out um, the correlation between the two variables, you could just take the, the off diagonal thing and divide by the square root of the two variances and it will give us the correlation. Okay, so the correlation is a number between, between minus 1 and 1 and tells us how they co-vary together. Okay. And the PDF, the probability density function, is the same kind of form. Okay. So you don't need to worry about most of it. Okay. You just need to know that the, the, the probability density function of some of variable x is just an exponential. And then in the exponential, we've just got a quadratic in x. So here I've written it as x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. But all that matters is there's an x times an x. Okay. So it's quadratic in x. That's all that matters. OK, so into the pictures. So all I've done in these sequence of pictures is just pick a mean vector and a, a variance matrix. Okay. And we're just going to look at um, generating random points from this distribution. Okay. So each random sample from this multivariate Gaussian is a point in the plane. Okay, so each of these points is one random sample. I've got 10,000 random samples here. Okay. So the mean vector here was 0, 0. Uh, I, I, I apologize, the axes are too small for you to read probably. But 0, 0 is in the center of this cloud here. Okay. And the variance covariance matrix, sigma, is a diagonal matrix here. Okay. So this says that it, uh, x1 has variance 1. Okay, so if I just look at the margins of x1, that's the system at the top, it's got spread about plus or minus 2. And the covariance is zero. Okay. There's no correlation between x1 and x2 here. These are perfect circles, okay, or ellipses, where they are uh, orthogonal to the axes, okay, so independent. So here I put points at um, confidence intervals at plus one standard deviation and plus two standard deviations. Okay. Uh, so th this inner circle contains 66% uh, of the points. This outer circle contains 95% of the points. Okay. okay. So let's uh, change this slightly. Okay. Let's, oh, I was to say, the correlation here, you can see is zero, the correlation between x1 and x2. So x1 and x2 are independent in this case. 
Okay, so I've just changed it uh, here. I've changed the mean to be 0, 1. So the mean, the cloud's shifted up to be centered around 0, 1. Okay. And I've changed the, uh, the variance of the, the x2 to be 0 0.2. So instead of circles now, we've got ellipses. But they're still orthogonal to the axes, the direction of the ellipses, because they're still independent random variables. There's no correlation, no co covariation between them. There's still zeros here. Okay. So now we start to get more interesting. I've just uh, changed the covariance, so there's now correlation between them. Okay. So the variance haven't changed. All I've changed is these off diagonal bits to be 0 0.9 here. Okay. What we've got now is x1 and x2 are correlated. If you tell me the value of x1, that gives me information now about x2. Yep. I can start to do modeling now. Yep. Tell me something about x2, I can learn something about x1, or vice versa. Okay. Whereas in this case, they're independent. Tell me something about x1, I've learned nothing at all about x2. Okay. As soon as we've got correlation, we can start to do learning that transfers across the different variables. Okay. So this is a correlation of 0.9. So you, can, that's, you, know, you might think 0.9 is quite high, but you can still there's quite a bit of spread around uh, relationship uh, the, um, between the variables. So if you know x1, you know something about x2, but there'll still be quite a range for any value of x1. Okay, if I uh, scale this matrix, so I just divided by three here, all that happens is the, the slope of it stays the same. Yep. It just shrinks. It gets uh, either bigger or smaller, but the slope stays the same because the correlation has stayed the same. All I've done is scale everything. Okay, I just made the variance reduced by uh, three. Okay. If I really ramp up the correlation, so I've gone from 0.99 here, you can see now, uh, you know, if, if you told me x1 was minus 2, that would really narrow down the value for x1. I can really learn a lot because there's a high correlation between x1 and x2. Okay. And just one final one. I've changed the matrix to be this term up here. Okay. And so you can see I've changed the, uh, the angle of the line here. So it's changed the axes are the same in each plot. Okay. But the correlation is not changed. So if we think about the correlation between x1 and x2, the correlation is the covariance, 0.54, divided by the square root of the variances. Okay. So divided by square root of 0.3 times 1. Okay. So it's still 0.99. Okay. So they're still correlated with uh, correlation 0.99. I've just changed the variance of x2. So instead of varying uh, variance 1, it's now got variance 0.3. Yes. Um, absolutely. Yeah, you need correlation, right? Uh, without correlation, you can't do modeling. So, are you thinking about things like MCMC, where you've got parameters that are correlated, or linear? You know, fitting a linear regression model. Right. Okay. High correlation. It's like, oh, you've got to take one of those variables out. Yes. So, what we're going to say, say in a minute is, uh, I'm going to make th uh, these the same variable, just the, the variable at different locations. I'll, I'll get to it. Um, but no, that, that kind of correlation, that multicollinearity can matter uh, in terms of hyperparameter estimation. And Nicola will talk about hyperparameter estimation. But in terms of um, the theory, no, it doesn't matter. Okay. It matters for identifiability, but um, not, in that, not in this kind of sense I'm talking here. Okay. okay. So let's just ramp this up a bit. So let's, here we had pictures in two dimensions. Now let's go to five dimensions. Okay, so I've got a five-dimensional covariance matrix, but it's hard to visualize things in 5D. Okay, so I'm going to present the pictures a bit differently. Okay. So before, I had pairs of points. This was variable one. This was variable two. Okay, and one point was uh, a random sample of these things. What I'm going to do now is just uh, put all the values of x1. Uh, I've got an artificial x-axis here, if you like. So all the values of x x1 are uh, at the point uh, one here. And all the values of x2 at the point 2 here, I've just joined them by a line. Okay. So this green point up here, you've got x1 is 1, x2 is 1. Okay. And so uh, we've got a line between them up here. Okay. So I've just taken the same information and just put them next to each other. Okay. I'm going to do this with five sets of points, and we're going to start to uh, build up the picture. Okay. So here, I've now got five points. The x-axis doesn't mean anything. It's just 
variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four, variable five. Okay? And I've just joined them by a line so you know which points came together. Yeah? Each kind of line represents one sample in this five dimensional space. That yeah, means zero. Okay? Well, uh, and this is the covariance where it started at one and drops off point one every time you flip between them. Okay, so the correlation between one and two is point nine, uh, between two and three is point nine, between three and four is point nine, and so on. Okay. What we do now is fill in the gaps here. Yep. I, I've got satisfied with five dimensions. I want to do 50 uh, dimensions. Okay. So it's the same points as before, but now I'm going to consider. Um, values in between here. Okay. So I'm going to keep the correlation between 1 and 2 is 0.9, but the correlation between x1 and x, the one that I've plotted at 1.1, I'm going to make 0.99 up here. Okay. And the correlation between uh, 1 and point, um, the point is here. The, the correlation between 1 and the variable I put at 1.0, uh, 1.2, I'm going to put 9.8. Okay. And so these are exactly the same samples as before, okay. just joined by lines here. I've just put more points in. Okay? It's in a higher dimensional space. Okay. And you can start to see now that these look like functions. Yep. So this is how we're going to think about Gaussian processes. We're going to think about them as random functions where if we take the value at any two points, we're going to have a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay. So here we've got a line described. Okay. And I put 50 points on this line. And I've just generated random samples in this fifth dimensional space, and I'm plotting them as live according to this covariance matrix. Okay. And this is a way, one way of thinking about Gaussian processes okay. uh, as functions in space where there's correlation between neighboring values. Okay. I'll define this formally in a second. Okay. This is just the way we think about them. We think about uh, them as infinite dimensional distributions over functions. Okay. So here I've just got 50 points, but a function is defined everywhere. So I think about the Gaussian process as being a distribution in infinite dimensional space. Okay. But when I look at any finite collection of points, we're just going to get uh, a Gaussian distribution back. Okay. So let's do it formally. So we're getting to processes now, Gaussian processes. So far, it's all been Gaussian distributions. Okay. So before we do Gaussian processes, let's think about what a stochastic process is. Okay, so a stochastic process is just any collection of random variables okay, indexed by something. Okay. So let's suppose I've got some set, curly x, and some index in that set, curly x. Okay. My stochastic process is just a bunch of random variables okay, where I've got uh, an index here okay, uh, in the set x. So here, my index set is 1 to 50. Yeah, I've got variable x1, uh, variable 2, variable 3, and so on. I don't need to restrict myself to integer subsets of the integers for index sets. Typically, what we might do instead is let our index set be, say, an interval of the real line okay, or an interval of real space. So I might think about x here denoting some point in space, okay, just an index. And then f of x is just a collection of random variables. So for any point x in x, I've got a random variable associated with it. And to do the, uh, describe the uh, stochastic process, we just think about how these random variables co-vary. Okay, okay yeah, let's just say if uh, my index set is some set of Rn, okay, then there's, uh, it's an uncountably infinite number of points in that index set. Yeah, if my index set is zero to one, here yeah, there's an infinite number of numbers in there, so I've got an infinite collection of random variables. We need to think about how to deal with that infinite collection. Of random variables. Okay. So, Kolmogorov showed a long time ago okay, that to fully describe a stochastic process, okay, there's a lot of technicality here, but to fully describe a, a stochastic process, all we need to, to consider are the finite dimensional distributions. So, in other words, for any number n, any counting number n, okay, if we pick any set of indices, so any set of locations, x to 1 to xn, then all we need to know is the distribution of those random variables for a finite n. Okay. And if we can do that for any finite collection, we can fully 
describe the stochastic process. This, this is an infinite dimensional process. Yep. There's an infinite number of random variables here, but as long as I can describe the distribution for any finite collection of them, we're OK. okay. We they uniquely determine the entire process. Okay, so what's a Gaussian process? So a Gaussian process is just a stochastic process with Gaussian finite dimensional distributions. So in other words, if you consider um, the value of the Gaussian process anywhere at any finite set of points, it has a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay. So f of x, if f is a GP, okay, it's got values everywhere, so we think about it as a function. Yeah, some function we don't know. But if I pick any finite collection of points and think about just those selection of points, so if I create a random variable, let's call it f, which is f at x1 up to f of xn. For any sets of these index locations, this just has a multivariate Gaussian distribution. That, that's the definition of a Gaussian process. It's just something that when we think about its values uh, at a finite set of points, it has a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So, any questions so far? No, I haven't really said anything yet, but. Yeah? No, it's a random function. Random function. We don't know its function. Okay, which as we can think about it as a collection of random variables. Yeah, so it's its value at the first va uh, va va uh, if it's on zero to one, say, yeah. uh, it's a value at zero. It's its value at uh, zero plus a tiny amount, plus a bit more, and so on. So it's its, uh, it's value everywhere is unknown. Okay, we we uh, we're just modelling its value as a random uh, distribution. We don't know its value. That makes sense. Okay, more questions. So you know when you um, increase the um, the Gaussian process, the the Gaussian thing from five to six. Yeah. Do you just interpolate the correlation? Uh, so that was just a choice, just for for presenting it. Okay, that was nothing to do with Gaussian. It was just for the pictures. Okay. Okay. So that uh, is uh, the value of this function if you, in, in this interpretation. It, it was just my collection of random variables before, but that's the random value. X here is not random, it's just the, um, the index in this new view. Okay. So there's an index, and at each point here, uh, there's a random variable associated to the function at that point. Okay. Uh, and that's what I plotted here. Okay. Any more questions? We're going to see this multiple times, okay? So um, this is why we have two introductions. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Um, you mentioned the relevant distribution. Is it just like by being in the GP only you need to consider finite uh, distributions or do something else? It's, it's surprising to me, okay. yes. Um, Are you more into the GP? Um, is there a probabilist in the room? Is uh, Nicholas still here? So I, I, I don't have a good intuition why that's the case. Um, I, I think this is actually quite a strong statement. You, you, M could be as large as you like here. Okay, so you need to know, um, and it's just something that drops out mathematically. Um, as I say, it's been known since Kolmogorov in the 30s, uh, but I, I can't remember how you prove it or anything like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, the question before we get into how to use Gaussian processes, and that's what the entire week's about, is why would we want to use this very restricted class of functions? We're saying here everything's got to be Gaussian. Okay. Why do we want to work with Gaussians? Well, we've talked about this briefly, but let's just spell it out a bit more. It's because Gaussian distributions have nice properties that make them easy to work with. Okay. So in particular, uh, let's suppose x and I, I apologise, I, 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 um, I should have used x here. Uh, x is a random variable here. Okay? I was using it as an index a moment ago. This is the, the, the random output here. Uh, I've done that terrible thing mathematicians do. Okay? But here, it's just a random variable. It's multivariate normal distribution. Okay? 
So it's normal if and only if, if we multiply x by any matrix A, we get a different normal distribution back again. Okay? So you, you take a Gaussian uh, random variable, you multiply it by something, all you do is you multiply its mean by something, and you multiply its, uh, multiply its covariance matrix by something. Okay? We still end up with something that's Gaussian. Okay. So that's a nice property. As I said before, it means we can add things together. Yeah. It means that uh, sums of Gaussians. Okay, so if A was a vector of ones, all we're doing is adding up the terms in here. Okay. It means marginal distributions are Gaussian. Okay. So um, if A is one zero zero zero, okay, you're just picking out the first element of the vector x, and this says that if the multivariate thing is Gaussian, individual terms in it must be Gaussian. This is kind of a nice property that makes it nice for us to work with. Okay. So one kind of consequence of this is that uh, our matrix, our variance matrix, sigma, must be what we call positive semi-definite. If X is Gaussian, if and only if uh, linear combinations are Gaussian, that means that terms like this have got to be positive whenever a, a is a vector. Yeah? So if A is a vector of points, it must mean that we have A transpose sigma A bigger than zero for all possible choices of A. Okay? And what that means is, that's the same condition as saying that the, the matrix sigma must be a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay? So equivalent statements. So we're going to hear lots um, this week, I imagine, about things not being positive definite. It's kind of a common numerical error we get when we use software. And the reason we need positive definiteness uh, in our covariance functions and so on is because of this, that we, we have to have um, variances when we add things together. Okay. So more importantly for Gaussian processes, okay, we've got um, a different property of Gaussian distributions that we're going to rely upon a lot. Yeah, please. Because it can be zero here. to have the zero variance? Uh, no, okay, it's just degenerate. It just means you know everything. Well, I think, uh, it collapses to a Dirac delta. It's okay. We're not going to worry about technicalities. Okay. But it's okay. In, in theory, we would like to be, have, uh, be able to consider zero variance. When we've learned everything, we would like the, the, the uncertainty to collapse to zero. Okay. Okay. So I'd say a, a more important property for us is that conditional distributions are still Gaussian. So Gaussians are closed under conditioning. So let's imagine we've just got uh, x, which is two variables, x1 and x2. Okay. This is its mean vector and its covariance matrix. Okay. What this says is that let's suppose we learn x1. Yeah? You've got two, uh, a random variable in two distributions. Let's suppose we learn x1. What do we then know about x2? What do we know after we've learned x1? The nice thing about Gaussians is that it rema everything remains Gaussian. Okay? So we'll see these terms in a minute. But it says, let's suppose uh, we've learned that capital X1, the random variable x1, takes value little x1. Okay? So the distribution x2 is still Gaussian, whereas before its mean was mu2, now we have a new mean for it. We've got mu2 plus a correction, if you like. Okay. So we've got a correction for how surprising x1 is. So this is the difference between x1 and its mean, prior mean. Okay. Then we can divide by its variance of x1, multiply by its, the, the inverse of its covariance matrix, and then uh, uh, multiply by how related it is to x2. So we've got some relationship here between uh, x1, so we had these kind of point clouds before. Okay. So if this is x1, this is x2. Okay. We, we learn the value of x1. Okay. First of all, we see how surprising it is. Okay. So we see the dis difference from here to here. Then we kind of uh, work out the, uh, divide by uh, whether that's a surprising distance, uh, deviation from its mean. Okay, so this is 
the mean which one is that distance surprising and then we kind of multiply by uh, how related it is to x2 the higher the correlation the more we're going to be able to learn about um, x2 so this is our best guess of x2 once we've um, conditioned on x1 and the correlation grows we're going to influence the mean more if the correlation is zero we're just going to end up back with where we started okay. we still have a similar expression for the uh, the variance okay. the, pos the, the, the you know the, the variance of x2 once we see x1 is the old variance of x2 sigma 2 2 and we subtract a bit depending on how much we've learnt so depending on how related x1 and x2 are and how variable uh, x1 is. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So we've uh, essentially a way to think about it is we've observed x1 here. Okay. Now what we 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 did think we started by thinking x2 had a a, a multiplicative guess like this. We now think it has a, a distribution like this. Yeah. So we think of it as a cut, you're right. Okay. So let's just think about why this is true. I think it's informative to see this once. We've got two random variables, x1 and x2. Okay. They co-vary, they're jointly distributed. So let's think about the distribution of x2 having seen x1. Okay. So by conditional probability, that's just the distribution of x1 and x2 divided by the distribution of x1. Okay. But I'm, I only care about x2 here. Yeah, so I can lose everything that doesn't have an x2 in it. So this is proportional to the distribution of x1 and x2. Okay, so let's write this out. We had, uh, this was uh, our, our multivariate PDF, multivariate density function. Okay. Uh, all I've done here is substitute our vector x for the, um, written it out as a vector, basically. So the, 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 the way uh, that multivariate Gaussians look is x minus its mean transposed times the inverse of the variance matrix, which looks like this. Okay, so I've just defined q to be the inverse of the variance matrix. And let's just expand this out a little bit. Okay. So I only care about x2. Anything that only has x1 in, I can forget about. Okay. So we're going to have an x2 minus mu2 times a q22 and we're going to get that twice this bit repeats over here and then we've got the cross terms so we're going to get x2 minus mu2 times a q21 times the x1 minus mu1 okay i'm going to get that twice because i'm going to get here and here and here okay but what is this okay if we look at this this is just something that's quadratic in x2 I've got an x2 squared and an x2. So we started with a quadratic in x. We're left with a quadratic in x2. So this is still multivariate Gaussian. And all we need to do now is just read off the relevant mean and covariance. Okay. So if we, if we look at this, this is just the same thing repeated. Okay. Just collect terms. Okay. So if we look at the x2 squared terms, it just appears from here. So we've got an x2, q22, x2. And then collect the terms that only have x2 once. We get something like this. Okay. And if we follow it through, okay, we get um, an expansion in terms of x2 minus the, all the kind of junk that we don't want to uh, keep track of, times the q22 in the middle. So we've got x2, q22, x2. <coughs> And then we just need to cancel that back out for the expansion, basically. Okay. So we can read directly off here the new mean, which is going to be this bit here, okay. and the new variance, which is the thing that uh, appears between the, uh, the x2 squared. Q22. And then we just have to appeal to uh, some kind of linear algebra to work out uh, the right form of these things. Okay. So there's a simple uh, the matrix inversion lemma that gives us the right form for these uh, for these terms, okay. So that's a property of Gaussians okay. that if we have a, a multivariate Gaussian and we condition on knowing some of its values, it's still multivariate Gaussian. Let's go back to Gaussian processes. 
we said that if f is a Gaussian process, then when we think about any finite collection of points, so have we got a board rubber, Will? Ah, thank you. I can find a pen that works properly. So we've got some unknown function, okay. and let's suppose we've got a collection of values, okay. and an x, which I'm just going to leave floating. Okay. So let's suppose we learn the value. We know the value of the function at these locations. Okay. So we get the value at x1. Uh, we want to know the value at x. Is value at x1, okay. The value at x2, okay. And the value at x3, let's say. Okay. So we said f is a Gaussian process. That means that when we look at its value at any collection of points, it must have a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay. So if we were to look at the vector, that is f of x1 f of x2, x3, and f of x. This must ha just have a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Some four-dimensional space with some mean and some covariance. Okay. The reason we like Gaussian processes is, let's suppose someone comes along and tells you the value of the function at the, oh, uh, these locations x1, x2, and x3, we now know the function's value. Someone comes along and tells you what the function is at these places. We still don't know it at x. That's my kind of free variable to indicate anywhere along here. What the reason we like Gaussian processes is that we started with multivariate Gaussian uh, specification all, but now we know its value at x1 up to xn. Our, our distribution for its value at x, this kind of anywhere, is still Gaussian. All we have to do is change the mean and the variance according to how we saw on the previous slides. So we started with something Gaussian, we've learnt the function value at a whole bunch of places, it remains Gaussian. Okay. So, in pictures, these are the pictures you'll see uh, in nearly every talk, I imagine, at some point. The way we think about these things is we uh, start off with a prior belief about um, our functions. Okay? Uh, that everything's just Gaussian according to some value. Okay, so we'll talk about the wiggliness of these lines and how, where they come from in a minute. Okay? Someone comes along and tells, this picture's not very clear, so I apologise. If someone comes along and tells you the value at a number of points, at five locations here, you get told the function's value. So you, you get told it passes through here, okay. and you get told it passes through here and over here. Okay. So we know it does something like this. Okay. But there are lots of lines that go through here. Okay. So we still have some uncertainty about things. So when we think about the value of the function at other locations, we don't know its value, we are uncertain about it, but we've got a mean for it, and we've got a variance for it. That's the way we think about Gaussian processes. So we start with a collection of random variables. We condition on some of them. We learn the value at some locations. And we're left with a Gaussian process still, but now one that is less uncertain than when we started. Okay. Okay, a any questions at this point? Yes, I am. I, 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 yes. So I apologise for the uh, having used it as a random variable earlier. But yeah, here, here it's just an index. It's a fixed index. Okay. So x tells me where I am along this axis. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the way I think about it. So uh, f of x one is one variable. F of x two is another variable. F of x three is another variable. Okay. And they all co-vary. They're all related. Yeah. Yeah, it could be multi-dimensions. Here, the index set is 
zero to 10. Yep. Uh, I've only considered uh, that the interval will be the line from zero to 10. So it's a one dimensional index set. But there are still an infinite number of random variables in here when I consider the function everywhere. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, please. So here I've chosen um, to make them go through this point. Okay? So I've assumed we know precisely what the value of the function is at these points. And so you know, the way of thinking about it is you know, there's an infinite number of curves I could have written down here, and I've only kept those ones that go through these points. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So let's go back to thinking about why um, we use Gaussian processes. Well, it's this, um, just to summarize what we just said, really. One is that they're closed under any kind of linear operation. So we can add them together. We still get a Gaussian process. We said we can add Gaussian distributions together. Okay. Gaussian processes are just distributions when you think about them all. So if I add two Gaussian processes together, they remain Gaussian processes. Okay. Most importantly, I think, is that they're closed on this Bayesian conditioning. Okay. So if someone tells you some information about the value of the function at some locations, okay. then the, the process conditioned on that data is still a Gaussian process. Okay. So, and you can, this information can come in all kinds of forms, okay. but let, in the simplest form, someone just tells you the value of the function here, here, here. Okay you update your beliefs if you kind of think in a Bayesian kind of language and you're, you're left with something that's still a Gaussian process. Okay. And I, 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 a strongest statement of the first thing is that uh, they're closed under any linear operation. Okay, so if F is a Gaussian process, and sorry, I've, I've not uh, explained what I mean by this yet, but if F is a Gaussian process, then you can do anything linear to it and you get left with something that's still a Gaussian process. You can uh, add them, you can multiply them by things, you can differentiate them, integrate them. Yeah, please. Oh, you're right. Just a conditioning on them. Yep, you're right. Yeah. That's the, the kind of thing I normally hate when people do actually use the word Bayesian uh, unnecessarily. Yeah, just conditioning on viewing them on things. Yeah. Working at, I guess, working at the posterior, but there's nothing Bayesian about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's think about um, how we work out the mean and covariance of these things. Okay. So we said that um, a Gaussian process is <coughs> any process where when we think about a finite collection of uh, values, it is a Gaussian distribution. So it has some mean and some, some covariance. And so the way we often write that is that the function is a Gaussian process with some mean function and some covariance function in a way I'll kind of describe now. And we need to think about how, how we determine what the mean is and what the variance is. So where does this mean vector here come from? Okay. Where does this covariance matrix come from? How do we end up with them for any index set here? Okay. So the, kind of the, the honest answer here is we, we pick values we like according to kind of modeling choices. Yeah? We think about means functions that are work for our problem. We think about covariance functions that work for our problem. Okay? But we'll, we'll see some covariance functions in a minute and kind of explore a little bit about how the, the, the choice of covariance really matters. Okay. So th how you pick the mean here, how you pick this mean vector, um, you've got kind of a free, free choice. You can do pretty much whatever you like in terms of how you pick the mean. Okay? So the most popular choices uh, are things like zero. You just assume a priori that all your random variables have mean zero. So they're centered around zero. Or you might choose to, mean, uh, to model them as just some constant. Yeah? 
for some value they fluctuate around or you might choose to make them uh, you might decide to put some structure in this mean here so you might choose to um, model them uh, a priori as a, a straight line yeah please Um, yes, you can do if you're going to think of a, 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 a hierarchical structure. Okay? So uh, if you had unknown parameters in here, then you'd be thinking of that as a random variable, yep, and you'd learn these separately. Yep. So uh, we'll talk a bit more about how to do that. Okay? But people do things like put neural networks in here and all sorts. Okay. 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 Much more importantly than the mean function is uh, the covariance function. Okay. So the covariance function tells us how we form this variance matrix sigma. How do we go about building this variance matrix? For any finite, for any selection of inputs, how do we form this covariance matrix? And the way we typically think about it is just thinking about a function that is a function of the distance between any two index sets. Okay. So if we have, um, let's get this picture. Let's suppose we're modeling uh, a function in 1D again. Okay. We need to think about, let's think about the value at x1, or at x and x prime, so it matches the slide. Okay. So that's uh, f of x and f of x prime. We need some way of specifying the covariance between f of x and f of x prime. This is what allows us to learn. So typically what we do is we use one of a small set of functions, okay. co covariance functions, and we assume that this correlation is a, a function of the distance between x and x prime. Okay. So I'm going to write this as k of x over x prime, or more generally, we often have it's a function of the distance between x and x prime. And so the idea is, if that x and x prime are close together, f of x and f of x prime are very similar. But if they're far apart, um, we're going to have um, them be very different. So we'll typically have things like k of uh, x and x prime is going to be approximately 1 if x equals x prime, okay. or approximately 0 if uh, x minus x prime is large. But we don't have to have that. It's just a, a choice we make. Okay. We choose to uh, use covariance functions that um, say the correlation is high if x is close to x prime, and it's small if x is far from x prime. Okay. So one thing about the choice of covariance matrix, which Nicola will talk a bit much more about, is they have to lead to val valid covariance matrices. When we consider the uh, process at just a finite set of points, at four points, it's going to give us a covariance matrix, okay, in a way I'll explain in a minute, and that has to be a valid covariance matrix. It has to be a positive semi-definite matrix, which means this has got to be a positive semi-definite function, okay, in a way we'll make uh, clearer later. Okay, let's get that. So let's just think about some examples here. Okay. So perhaps the most widely used uh, covariance function is what's called uh, the radial basis function, or RBF uh, covariance, or uh, the squared exponential covariance function, or the exponentiated quadratic covariance function, or uh, occasionally even the Gaussian covariance function, which is a very bad name for it. And it just takes the difference between the distance between x and x prime and squares that distance. Okay? So it says the covariance drops off as e to the minus square of this distance. Okay? And as we'll see in a minute, the choice of covariance determines how wiggly these lines are, okay? how fast they vary, and how differentiable they are, how smooth they are, okay? and so on. So what I've plotted here is, I've supposed uh, I've got an index set that's 0 to 5, and then I've just generated random curves, random functions, from a Gaussian process with mean 0, and this as our covariance function. Okay. So I get a covariance matrix here that is 
all zeros. And for my sigma, okay, I've just uh, enumerated a large number of points between 1 and 5. And then I've said that the, uh, the, the covariance between the ith and jth point is just this covariance between xi and xj. Okay. And I've used this function to work out that covariance. And then I've generated random variables and I've plotted them as functions here. Okay. So what I'm going to do uh, in the next slide is I take the same covariance function, but now I divide this distance between x and x prime by 0.25. Okay. So previously, if there's a distance between them that was uh, 1, x minus x prime was 1, now it's going to be 4 here when I divide by 0.5. Okay. So I've kind of uh, stretched the space. I shrunk the space, sorry. So you can see that now the curves vary much faster. Here, a distance 1 had correlation e to the minus a half. Now, in this, a distance 1 has a correlation e to the minus 2. Okay, so much less correlation. So the correlation between points that are one and uh, distance one apart has got much smaller, so the, the functions are free to wiggle much faster. Okay, they can vary much faster. Okay. Still in this RBF class of functions, uh, covariance function, now I've divided by four. Okay. Okay. So now I've said four is kind of the distance that matters. So before, points that were one apart e to the minus a half in correlation. Now, the e to the minus um, one thirty-tooth. Yeah? So there's really high correlation. Approximately, they're, they're, you know, the correlation is close to one. Right? So the effect of this is to mean that these curves hardly vary at all. Okay? If you know its value at zero, you could take a pretty good guess at its value at five. Okay? Whereas here, if you know its value at zero, it tells us nothing about the value at five because the covariance they, they vary much faster. Okay. So other people will get into these things, but um, we call this parameter here the length scale. It tells us the, the length over which the process varies. Here we're saying distance of 0.25 is kind of the, the distance between values of x on the x-axis that points are correlated to each other. Here we're saying 4 is about the distance over which the correlation drops off. Okay. Another thing we could do to covariance functions is to multiply them by things. Okay, so I've, got, I've gone back to uh, dividing by 1, dividing by, you know, not divided by anything here, so we've got a length scale of 1. But now I've just multiplied by 100 at the front. Okay? And all that does is change the x-axis. Okay? We started off with a 1 at the front here. So they uh, had the, a, a variance of 1. Okay? So they, they vary between two, minus 2 and 2. I've multiplied by uh, 100. So the standard deviation of the process has become 10. So they vary between about minus 20 and 20 now. Okay. Okay. So this is just one particular case of covariance function. Yeah. This is uh, the RBF uh, covariance function. But there are other choices. Okay. So a popular class is the Matern class. So there's a whole family of covariance functions called the Matern. Um, and you have to specify the degrees of freedom. Okay? And they're, they're normally given as powers of two, so odd powers of two. Okay? So this is return three over two. And as you let this number increase, okay, you get back to um, the radial basis function case. Okay? So what's the difference between these two curves? So they kind of vary in a very kind of qualitatively different sense. Yep. Even when I've got the, the wigglier curves, the, the wiggliness of this looks very different to the wiggliness of these types of curves. Okay. It's to do with the differentiability of the, the underlying functions. Okay. So, uh, for re uh, things we'll get into later, uh, the covariance function determines how differentiable your sample paths are. Okay. So with RBF covariance functions, you get sample paths that are infinitely differentiable. Okay? So they have derivatives of all orders. Yep. So 
how many times do you want to differentiate? They are analytic functions. They vary very smoothly. Other covariance functions don't have that. Okay? So the term three over two uh, are once different differentiable functions. Okay? So th these curves can all be differentiated once, but the second derivatives don't exist. Okay? That's why we get a, a different qualitative feel to them. They can vary much more rapidly than the smooth RBF curves. Another choice of covariance uh, is the Brownian motion kernel. Okay. So Brownian motion is the uh, Wiener process of white noise uh, integrated. Okay. So they all start at zero here. And if we use this covariance function, you get um, curves that are nowhere differentiable. Okay. And they're infinitely variable, in fact. You know, the fact I liked about these was that uh, if you look at an arbitrarily small segment of one of these curves, you can find the complete works of Shakespeare in your own handwriting. You know, the, the variation is that great. You know, they, uh, uh, the, the variation is unbounded. Okay. So if you compare Brownian motion, nowhere differentiable to RBS, analytic functions that are infinitely differentiable, they're a very different type of process. Okay. We have white noise. So white noise says that let's let the, uh, the covariance be one if x is x prime and zero otherwise, and this just gives white noise. At any different point along here, we have uh, independent draws. Okay. Still a Gaussian process. Okay. So the covariance is the kind of most important aspect here of our, our kind of prior specification of the gas process. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I, I've chosen um, to plot, I can't remember, uh, every point zero one or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've just chosen how to generate these plots. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to particularly, but um, other people will talk about how to do the parameter estimation. Okay. So in all these covariance functions, I mean, I've not written it as such, but um, they, they have what are called hyperparameters. Okay. So typically we might have things like uh, K of X, X prime for Brownian motion, say, oh, sorry, for RBF be sigma squared, so we call it a variance parameter, E to the minus uh, X minus X prime over lambda squared. Okay. And so sigma squared and lambda are uh, hyperparameters, okay? things we don't know. We're going to have to estimate them in some way. And the way we typically do that is by optimization. We choose some criteria and choose to uh, pick sigma squared and lambda squared to uh, give the best uh, um, predictions according to that criteria, typically maximum likelihood. Yep. So we look at the likelihood of our predictions, and we choose them to, to maximize it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, please. No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> so um, when I first started working with Gasberg, I spent a long time looking at these things, trying to kind of, you know, wh where's the intuition? Why this one looks smooth and, you know, uh, this one doesn't. Um, it's very hard to uh, get any intuition by looking at them. Okay. So mathematically, um, the, the degree of differentiability of the sample paths is the de degree for the de degree of differentiability of the covariance function at zero, okay, for stationary processes. Have I said that right? Uh, anyway, someone will talk about it later. But so there, there are ways we can determine it mathematically, but um, I find it very hard to intuit it by looking at them. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a modeling choice, isn't it? Do you think the thing you're modeling is a differentiable function? Do you want it to be smooth? Yeah. We can't model anything with white noise. Yeah. You know, that's not a model, that's just chaos. It's not even chaos, it's, it's just nothing, noise. Say it again, sorry. It's more a, a characterization of the function that you want to model. 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you want to exploit it, but generally it's a, a, a modeling choice you make. Am I happy modeling uh, whatever it is I'm modeling uh, by an uh, infinitely differentiable function? And most people aren't, but most people do it anyway because they kind of default setting kind of thing. Uh, so often I like to work with these matern classes okay, and have one or two degrees of differentiability. That's kind of the right kind of smoothness for many problems, but you have to build it up. Um, by, by looking at the problem, I guess. Yeah, but it's definitely a modeling question. Okay. How am I doing for time? Okay. So, uh, as I say, so the, the Gaussian process kind of inherits its properties primarily from the covariance function. The mean function doesn't matter. You know, the mean function just shifts things up or down. I mean, it, it matters a lot from a modeling point of view. Yeah? If you're using Gaussian process for prediction, the mean matters a lot. Yeah? But in terms of the mathematics, uh, we don't have to worry too much about the mean function. It's just a, a modeling point. So fr from uh, the covariance function, we, we, we inherit things like its smoothness, its differentiability, its variance. Okay, so just one final example then. Let's suppose we had um, k of x, x prime, just be x times x prime. Okay. And I've drawn random samples from this Gaussian process. And I just get straight lines that go through zero. So the question is, well, what's happening here? Why, why does this happen? Why do we just get straight lines? Well, let's suppose that we wanted to model with straight lines. Let's suppose that our model was f of x is c times x, okay? where we don't know the value of c. Okay? Uh, let's suppose c has a normal 0, 1 distribution. We're just, we're just gonna, that's going to be our model. Yeah, I'm just going to choose this as my model. If we then think about What's the covariance between f of x and f of x prime? Yeah, the, the function at x and the function at x prime. Well, that's just the covariance between c times x and c times x prime. Well, x and x prime are just indexes. They're not random. So that's just x times the covariance between c with itself, the variance of c, and x prime. So this is just x times x prime. Yeah. So if we have this as our model, we get this is our covariance function. Okay. So if this is our covariance function, this is our model, essentially. So I I simple inner products of x are just straight lines through the origin. Okay. So what we're going to see in a minute is that we can, we, another way of thinking about Gaussian processes is that they're a generalization of linear models. We take these things and we just generalize linear models for them. Okay, so just to kind of finish off this bit then, just to um, write down what we've said, but in this notation with the kernels. We said that if f is a Gaussian process, okay, then n, its value at any finite collection of points, x1 to xn, and another variable, uh, another location x, which I'm just going to let be free, is just multivariate Gaussian. I assume it's got mean zero here, and, and some variance matrix sigma. Now let's suppose we're going to use a covariance matrix to uh, form uh, this, uh, sorry, a covariance function to form this covariance matrix. So I'm just going to let uh, sigma be this matrix here. Okay. So, so in, in the center of it, we've got what's called the uh, kernel matrix. So uh, this thing I wrote down here, so I've called it k here. So k, the ij element of uh, k is just the, the, the covariance function applied to xi and xj. It's the correlation between xi and xj. And then appended as a row and as a column, I'm going to have uh, a column of the co uh, correlations, or the covariances, sorry, between x1 and x, x2 and x, xn and x. Okay. And similarly, I'm going to append the same thing as a row at the bottom. Okay. So we said that the nice thing about Gaussians is condition them and we end up still with a, uh, a, uh, another Gaussian. Okay. So if we condition on knowing uh, the function f at locations x1 to xn, then our distribution for f at any location x is still Gaussian, and all we've done is we've changed the mean. Okay. It started at mean zero. Okay. It's now become uh, this function here, and we've changed the covariance okay, to this uh, function here.
you're right. Sorry, you're right. I, I, uh, yeah, you didn't. Um, I added that this morning at <laughs> breakfast. I apologise. That's a typo. So what I should have said is um, we've got um, f of x. Sorry, this collection of points f of x one, f of x n, uh, f of x. Oh, I'll, I'll leave it like that. Okay, so let's leave that as normal naught sigma. Okay, and then I'm just going to rub out that um, the sigma squared bit. So uh, our posterior mean is going to become m of x, which is k of x, k inverse uh, y. Okay. Yeah. So just assume sigma squared is zero. I apologise. That was a slightly different setting I had. Okay. So we just um, where this k of x is just this bottom row from from here, the correlation between our test point x and all the training points x one up to x n. And the covariance also changes. We get the old covariance changed by, and assume sigma squared zero again, okay, uh, changed by the covariance between all the different points. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Apologize for the typo. Okay. So just to finish off then, I just want to give a, a, a different point of view on. Um, Gaussian processes and another different kind of motivation for why you might want to use Gaussian processes and that is they give us a way of doing non-parametric regression okay they generalize linear regression into a non-parametric world okay so we're going to view uh, them as uh, this kind of non-parametric extension to linear regression and our covariance matrix k is going to determine what space of functions our sample paths live in so here, our sample paths were determined uh, fixed to be straight lines. Okay? And if we had only straight lines for the origin, this is our covariance function. Okay? This covariance function determines this space of functions. What we're going to see now is that we can use much richer spaces of functions, uh, and they correspond to different choices of covariance function. So let's suppose we're given data that are pairs of x and y's. And let's just think about linear regression for a minute, and we'll generalize linear regression. I assume everyone's seen linear regression before. So we're going to want to fit a model that y is x beta plus epsilon. Okay. And we're just going to rewrite the way you normally have seen it. Okay. Okay. So normally, uh, when you first do it at university, you think about uh, linear regression as being solving this minimization problem. You want to minimize the sum of squared errors, okay. so the misfit between y and x beta, the misfit between y and the data prediction, all those errors squared. Okay. And I'm doing ridge regression here. Um, so my sigma squared's reappeared, okay. um, just to penalize these parameters. Okay. So I want to minimize, with respect to beta, this expression. So the, the, the data misfit plus a penalty term, um, so this is ridge regression or L2 uh, penalization, ticking of regularization, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And the, the the uh, expression we get for our value of beta hat, the optimal choice is x transpose x plus sigma squared i inverse x transpose y. Yep. So you've probably all seen that in your undergraduate course. Yeah. Yes. So sorry, that's the wrong parameter. That's what you're going to say, isn't it? Yeah, I, I apologize. So I've mixed up the regularization here. Okay. So um, my sigma squared's in a bit of a mess. I uh, apologize for that. It's still the same error. But uh, this is going to be the variance of our noise term. Okay. Sorry, just yeah, please. So the, the, in the first two lines, the sigma squared should be two different. It should be two different variables, yeah, absolutely. So th this should just be a, a different variable that relates to sigma squared, but it's not the same thing. I, I, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay. So you can rewrite. Um, the least squares estimator from the form we kind of know it in into this form. Okay. So it's very, it's very easy to, si to see that. Um, you just kind of use this identity. I'll put the, these slides online. We'll make them available to you. But we just kind of rewrite the term in here um, and take an x transpose out of this expression and apply the inverse to each side. Okay, And we get um, an expression like this. And so this is what is known as the dual form. This is the primal form of the solution. This is the dual form of the solution. 
The question is, why might we like this form of solution? Okay. Because at, at first glance, this dual form looks like a harder thing to compute than the primal form. Okay. Here, we started, if we've got uh, P parameters or features, okay, and N is the number of data points, the normal way of doing it ends up with a P by P matrix here. Okay. And so if, we, if we've got more data points and parameters, we've got to invert a P by P matrix. Here, we've converted to an N by N matrix. Okay. So it looks like we made the problem harder. But the nice thing about the dual form is that it only uses inner products. Mm -hmm. If we think about what X, capital X, X transposed is, we get this uh, kernel matrix, and it's just the inner product of all our uh, uh, data locations. Okay, so the, the first term is X1 transposed X1, X transposed 1, X2, and so on. Okay. So they're just inner products here. Okay. And then if we want to do a prediction of Y at a new location, X prime, the way we do uh, predict uh, y prime is to do x prime times our estimate, uh, estimated parameter vector beta hat. So if we plug that in in the dual form, we get uh, this expression here, okay. where our x, x transposed, is just uh, what I've called k, okay, where the i j element is the inner product between xi and xj. And then multiply by vector at the front of x prime times x1, x prime times x2, and so on. Okay. And so this is exactly the same form as we had here. Okay. Exactly the same expression. And the, the choice of covariance function is this inner product covariance. Okay. So by doing linear regression here, and I didn't have an intercept, that's why all the lines go to zero. We've ended back up with something that looks just the same as Gaussian process regression. Okay. So what we what we normally do to make linear regression uh, more powerful, to expand the class of functions from going just between straight lines between zero and one, okay, we add things like intercepts. Yep. Or you might add quadratic terms. We add features in here. Okay. So one thing we might do is replace x by a vector of features. So instead of just using x, we might use uh, a, a 1 to get an intercept, an x, and an x squared to get quadratic uh, curves. Okay. And all it does is change the expressions on the previous page. Instead of being inner products between x's, they're now inner products between feature vectors. Okay. Now, the clever thing is that for some sets of features, you can compute the inner product between them very easily. Okay. For some particular choices of feature vectors phi, the evaluation of uh, the feature vectors just works out as some function k. Okay. And in particular, for some infinite sets of feature vectors, okay, you can have vectors here that are infinitely long, but when you come to compute inner products, you just get um, the, the, the inner product just becomes some simple function of uh, x and x prime. Okay. So a sketch of uh, a particular thing that happens is, let's suppose we have features that are Gaussian humps centered at uh, n different locations. So here I've got the feature vector for x is e to the minus x minus some location c1 squared. Some other location C2 squared up to some other location Cn. Okay? So we've just got different humps at different locations. Then, remarkably, somewhat, if we let the number of these locations, these C1s, go uh, to infinity, we fill in the kind of space in some finite interval, the inner product between any two points becomes our kind of old friend, our radial basis function. Okay? So if we take features like this, get, let them get longer and longer and longer, the inner product between any two uh, ve infinite vectors for those features at x and at some new location x prime just becomes um, the inner product, I've got to prime off, but an inner product, uh, it just becomes this radial basis function expansion. Okay. So to see that, I've just uh, imagined we've got um, 
some points, a small collection of points. I'm going to put Gaussian humps at four locations. Okay, so these locations are just one at zero, one at 0 0.25, I think, you know, 1.7, sorry, that's 0 0.33, 0 0.66, and at one. Okay, so just Gaussian humps. I'm just going to use the, Gauss, uh, the linear regression formula, x transpose x, inverse x transpose y, with these features that are just the Gaussian humps evaluated at where the data are. Okay. So if we just do linear regression with these things, we get uh, least squares fit that looks something like this. Okay, so that's with four humps. If I instead have 40 Gaussian bumps here, so I've now got 40 of these bumps, we get a curve that goes through all the points. Okay? And if, as I let that go to infinity in here, instead of 40 points, I had an uh, infinite number of kind of these Gaussian bumps, we get back to Gaussian process regression. Okay. So this is what's called the kernel trick, right? For those of you who've done mach some machine learning. Um, what we're doing is we're going to use an infinite dimensional uh, feature vector, phi. And because we can do linear regression solely in terms of inner products, we never need to evaluate those features. We never need to work out this feature vector. All we need to do is to work out this covariance function between things. Okay? So we've got in some sense, a model with infinite kind of uh, representat representative power, okay? It's, um, it's very flexible, non-parametric class, infinite number of features, but all we need to do still is just work out uh, the covariance between points in this term. Yeah? So I, I, I'm not um, I'm not um, very familiar with SVMs, but uh, do they have to be um, positive semi-definite? Yeah. Yes. So any positive semi-definite uh, kernel can be used here. Okay, and it's the same idea as um, in SVMs or in kernel PCA or any of the other kind of things. You are um, so this is the picture you normally see for the kernel trick, right? This is uh, for classification. You can't separate these points in. 2D, but you project them to a higher space and you can separate them. And the same, same thing's happening here. We can't, might not be able to model using just x's and x squareds. Okay? So instead, we use this much richer set of features that corresponds to some set of um, features that, uh, that correspond to some kernel, okay? and we get much uh, stronger power. Okay. Uh, modeling power. Okay. Yeah, please. So um, you could, if you're doing linear regression, write down by hand a set of features to use. Yep. You could say, I want an x term, a linear term, I want a quadratic term, I want some trigonometric terms. Okay. And do linear regression like that. Okay. In Gaussian processes, we take the opposite approach. Okay. What we do, we don't um, think about the features. Instead, we pick some covariance function. But any covariance function corresponds implicitly to some set of features. So if you pick an RBF kernel, or the radial basis function kernel, it corresponds to features that look like this, the Gaussian bumps at different points in space. Okay? If you pick a different kernel, it corresponds to a different set of features. Now normally we don't think about these features at all. Okay? We just pick a covariance function and in the background, what's happening is this um, infinite, uh, regression in this infinite dimensional space. Okay, but we don't typically think about uh, the, the feature vector. But it's useful to think about what, the features, what features correspond to each type of uh, covariance function. Does that, does that answer your question? So, um, the, the <laughs> so I, I, I've confused you here. I apologize. So, um, the they are, are a function of our model. Okay, we pick a covariance function, okay, 
and any covariance function can be written down as uh, the inner product between two features, vectors, okay? but we never do that. Okay? Uh, I'm just giving you a, a, a different interpretation of how people, how you could think about Gaussian processes, that you are doing linear regression in this much richer space. Okay? One property of doing this is that it tells us that our posterior mean is, uh, lives in a, um, the space that is defined by these features. Okay? So if you only have features that look like smooth Gaussian humps, then all your curves have to look like linear combination of these smooth Gaussian humps. If you have features that look rougher, okay, then you can get um, a rougher representation of um, functions. Okay. Does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about it. But, um, okay. So uh, the whole point of uh, um, doing it is just to kind of introduce you to this, this kind of phrase, this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay. So uh, when we pick a covariance function, we are restricting the class of functions that we're considering to lie in some particular space of functions. Okay. And that space of functions is determined by the covariance function. Okay. Some covariance functions have very uh, smooth, uh, we can uh, restrict it to very smooth sets of functions. Others uh, give us much greater expressive power but with kind of weaker assumptions, it's you need more data. Okay, it's kind of a, a trade-off. Okay, I think I've said that. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there. Okay. Um, so Nicola is going to do um, some more kind of introductory material after uh, the break. Okay. Um, but after we take questions, we're going to have a, a coffee break. And um, we'll start again at, at 11, I think. So before we do, are there any more questions? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, so, so um, absolutely, um, the, the, the way you'd really want to do th this is to think about what space of functions you want to model in, that determines a covariance function, then you just do the, the Gaussian process update thing. Okay. In practice, we, we, we never do that. We kind of try out a whole bunch of covariance functions. Okay. We optimize the covariance function by doing hyperparameter estimation, whoever it was that asked about that. And so we kind of uh, have this back and forth kind of procedure where we, um, We, we pick a particular covariance function, we test out its predictions, see is it any good. If it's not, we go back, pick another covariance function, and so on, we, and we build that up kind of, in a way you build up any kind of modeling um, sequentially. Yes, people have tried to automate it. So the, the parameter estimation, you, you just, you pick, typically pick a criteria, like maximum likelihood, and you do it. But in terms of what covariance function, that's typically done by hand, yeah. Um, I mean, people have tried to automate it. I'm not sure how successful those attempts have been, but you know, typ typically it's back and forth kind of iterative approaches. Yeah. Any? Yeah, please. Are there types of functions we can't model? Are there types of functions we can't model? types of functions we can't model easily for Gaussian processes? Yeah, there, there are a lot of functions. So um, you can't have monotone functions, for example. Or, or rather, uh, we, we can model monotone functions approximately, but monotone functions can't lit. They can't be a. Um, we, we can't have a space that only has monotone increasing functions. So yeah, it, it is a restricted class. It has to be a Hilbert space. Um, that's not to say you can't find a particular space that's a good approximation. But yeah, absolutely, there are things we can't model. 
everyone's dying for coffee. So uh, any, any final questions? Okay, we'll leave it there and we'll start again at 11, is it Maurizio? Yeah, okay.